All right, guys, we're back again with another great episode of PFREI, A Passion for Real Estate Investments. I'm your host, Fuquan Bilal. Today we have Martin Bonesire. Now, Martin, actually, let me just talk a little bit about your, your background real quick, because um, I was really impressed by um, your bio. Since Martin became a, a world-class martial arts competitor somewhere around 2000 to 2004 Olympics, and a judo. So you yes. Got, all right, all right. And this is, um, along with that honor, uh, he's also been privileged to be a three-time world team member and a seven-time national champion. Uh, he won a bronze in 2003 Pan American Games. He placed ninth in 1999 World Cup Championships and has, and has a two-time gold, and was a two-time gold medalist at the U.S. International uh, Invitation U.S. Open Championships. Wow, it's pretty impressive now. It looked like uh, you found real estate, and well, you thought IT was a lucrative career, um, but then you transitioned um, into real estate. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. The first question I always ask guests is, why are you passionate for real estate investments? Well, you know, that's a good question. Uh, I, uh, I think for me, it's because it allows me to blend, uh, my background is, as you mentioned, is engineering. So, oops, sorry about that. All right. My alarm going. Um, so I'm a numbers guy. I love, uh, you know, so I, I love numbers. I love analytics. And uh, so there's that component in real estate. Uh, but also you get a chance to help people. And, uh, and then, of course, the uh, third component is you get to build wealth for if you do it well. And uh, so passive income. We all need to earn active income. But if I, if I can earn passive income, passive income on top of, my active income, that's, uh, you know, that's gravy and it allows, uh, you know, for more possibilities and hopefully freedom in the future. And, and I think those are some of the reasons I, I love real estate. Yeah, that's the common uh, theme that I hear with everyone when I ask that question is freedom. <laughs> yeah. The time to do what you want to do when you want to do it. So start, so I'm being, how long have you been investing in real estate? Well, I bought my first property probably 20 years ago, actually more than 20 years ago, but I didn't really become full-time active until about 10 years ago. It actually going on 11 now, right at, uh, right in 2008, right before the stock market crash uh, is when I bought my first five houses here in Arizona. Okay. So the Arizona market is where you are. And before, before the session, we were talking a little bit about the strategies that you're doing out there. And you mentioned that you do a little bit of wholesaling, uh, but your, your cash cow is fix and flips. And, um, how is that market out there in Arizona with the fix and flips? Are you guys being, are you seeing a compression? Oh yeah. On inventory? Yep. Compression inventory, compression on margins. Uh, it's definitely, it's, it's definitely getting squeezed big time. So on your rental portfolio, because I know you, you do some of that as well. You're, you're transitioning some of that portfolio into buying performing notes. Let's talk a little bit about that. Is that because it's more passive? Uh, less of dealing with tenants, tall as trash, termites. That you that you want to transition a, a portion of your portfolio onto performing notes. Well, um, it's a combination of the above. Um, you know, there's different people, with different perspectives, and I'm not saying that what I'm doing is what you know is the quote unquote right thing for everybody. But the reason I'm doing it for me is I've been accumulating my rental portfolio since 2008, and. Uh, if you might remember in Phoenix at the bottom of the market from that 2008 to 2011 timeframe, houses were cheap. And so we've got so much equity tied up in our rental portfolio. Now, granted, we could recapture some of that equity by taking out, you know, by refinancing, but then it would cash flow even less than it does now. So I think my first point is rentals are not nearly as profitable as a lot of people think. Um, and I think the real advantage to rentals is really to offset income being earned somewhere else with all the depreciation. So I've definitely benefited from that. Plus, we've had such incredible appreciation over the last 10 years in Arizona. Uh, so for me, I think it's, it's a move to take my, my chips off the table, so to speak. There's a lot of equity that I'd like to redeploy. I think I can get a much higher, if I look at my cash on cash return, it's very high because I don't have, because the property values were so much lower when I purchased many of these. 
However, if I look at my return on equity, if meaning if I were to sell the property, I took that lump of cash, how much am I earning today on that as a rental versus if I deploy it somewhere else? And I personally feel I can get a much better return with performing notes when I take a look at my return on equity. So that's where I'm selling and then I'm redeploying that capital into uh, performing notes. And of course there's pros and cons to that as well, but I love the performing note space. Uh, there's a lot of advantages to it. Um, and I feel like the market as is at a, a high right now. And so I'm not so worried about, you know, to me the only downside to notes is you don't have the appreciation of the asset, right? But there's so many other benefits to it that um, I feel like it's a, a great move for us. They say, Martin, they say the best seat at the table is the lender. <laughs> I agree. You know, like, well, you mentioned tenants, to termites, toilets, etc. You know, property management's not fun. Um, I mean, one of the advantages when you do have a, a portfolio is you can, you can outsource it or you can have a full-time staff, so I don't personally have to deal with a lot of that, but it's still a cost and it's still an aggravation. Um, and uh, as you know, the, the owner gets paid last, the lender gets paid first. Uh, plus, the lender doesn't have any liability versus the owner who has all the liability. And so there is so many great reasons to be a lender instead of the owner. And I'm really looking forward to making that shift fully. So you're making a shift from a landlord to a lean lord. Yes, precisely. <laughs> so I actually have this term that I trademark is called diversified hybrid real estate investing. And what that means to me is being able to take my 20 year experience, you're a veteran in the business also, and leverage the knowledge that I've learned in how to do flips, how to do rentals and notes, and being able to have processes and systems in place in a great team that I could be the visionary and direct all those guys to kind of bring that into fruition fully. And that kind of gives you a buffer and hedge against what's to come. So the market uh, prices go too high or there's some type of uh, foreclosure increase and the banks are going to start selling paper again. So if you're on that side, you can receive some of that paper and you have the process and system to work it out. So, yeah. I mean, for me, I, I didn't transition. I started off in real estate. I got into the note business in 2011 and I focused just on that. Stopped doing the real estate. Maybe only 20% of my time was dedicated to real estate. And now I find myself where it is, and I used to go around, no tenants, trash, tallest termites. Because I had the same awakening that the note business was it. I mean, laptop, cell phone. Um, it's still packed because you actively have to manage your vendors, but it's less um, strainful as managing property management companies and everything that comes along with the tenants. Yeah. Um, both is important. I mean, that's what, what I've learned in, over my investing career is that if you can do both to kind of mitigate your risk in your portfolio, then it's good to have that balanced portfolio. And then notes is ordinary income, right? So having those the depreciation factor from the rentals can help offset some of that um, some of that ordinary income. Right. Note business is definitely good. So performing notes, you, you mentioned specifically performing notes. Is there a reason why you're going down that lane instead of trying to get a better yield, buying some non-performing stuff and transitioning to performing? Yeah, you know, I, I'm intrigued by the non-performing note business and, of, and, I've, um, and it's certainly something that we could do it's just a choice of where we want to apply our, our time and our efforts. Um, and I'm looking really to grow the active side of my business, the trusted home buyer, with what we do there. So really this is just, these are my personal, my personal assets that I just, I want to be as low management as possible. Um, and additionally, there's some really cool ways as I'm sure I, sure you're aware of too of where you can really increase your yield on performing notes by bringing in um, uh, other investors who are looking for passive income and so that's something that uh, we're doing we um, you know if we borrow let's say 50 60 percent of the property value or the loan balance you know depending you know, there's different ways you can do the math so that's a really secure position for your lender they get a very predictable rate of return but, by, uh, but it allows um, you, the note owner, to, uh, to really to increase your yield by being, uh, being in the middle, so to speak. 
Yeah. I don't know if you want me to get into that. But. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the partials and so many different things that you could do with performing notes and collateral. Right. That's what actually got me really, what made me fall in love with notes. It's just that partial strategy where you can actually um, hypothecate and do so many different things with the performing notes. So I'm, I'm right there with you, buddy. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, um, it's amazing how you learn one side of real estate and that's a whole new world. Like so many people don't even know about the note business and the power of being a lender and um, different ways on how to bank leverage that asset class. And you can essentially do the same thing. Now there's some compliance and, and license requirements in certain states that you have to be aware of. But other than that, you play by the rules. It could be very, very profitable. You know, it's yeah. the, the resources that sell the assets. So for me, I found there's three things to be successful in the business. Of course, the capital to buy, the source to buy from and scalability. Like if I was to say, here's a thousand performing notes right now, you know, can you handle it? You know, you're a numbers guy. I'm pretty sure you'll figure out some processes and systems. But that's been my biggest challenge is uh, scalability, you know, always having that capital to deploy in the right type of asset. And then when you find that nice tree where you can take down a couple of hundred loans, you know, can you manage that? Do you have the process and system? What are some of the challenges that you face, um, you know, making that transition from a landlord to a lien lord, you know, in your business? You know, so far we really um, haven't had many challenges. Our, in that regard, our primary challenges are on our, our active income business, the fix and flips and deal acquisition and that type of thing. And par but part of the reason, to be perfectly candid on that, is it is newer for us. Um, so, uh, but so far it hasn't been um, it hasn't been that difficult. Now, granted, though, when we're uh, I guess when you're talking a couple hundred notes, when uh, we're buying on average un unpaid principal balance of about a hundred grand. So, you know, a million bucks is only 10 notes. Yeah. So uh, we don't, our number of notes to manage isn't extraordinarily large, but that's the beauty of performing notes. There's not a whole lot to manage. I mean, the about the worst thing that can happen is they stop paying and you work with them to try to get them to pay or you hand it over to your attorney. I mean, there's not a whole lot to do, you know? Yeah. The Tony the attorney or the servicer, those in your power team, which I call it, which is the attorney, the servicer, um, they will, or the asset manager that you have managing both of those vendors, they will ultimately make it a more passive investment yeah. for you. Are, you. are you guys seeing any challenges on the acquisition side of your market? For notes? Oh, no, for real property. Yes, absolutely. That's part of the appeal uh, for me uh, on becoming more active in the note space is because the acquisitions has been um, so challenging. The deal flow has really dropped off. And, uh, but that's why I really want to put my focus, put energy and time. Cause I don't, um, I'm passionate about that side of my business as well. I feel like we've got a good company, a good brand, and we're doing some really cool things that we're hoping to roll out in 2020 to, uh, grow that side of our business. So for me, notes is really, uh, passive and the um, active side is i mean and that's why I'm, like we talked about earlier that's why i'm wanting passive income from the notes so that i can dedicate my time to uh to uh, dealing with the acquisition problem and solving some new problems um in a creative way and in, in the um, in the acquisition space yeah i definitely appreciate your honesty you know, i guess some people on the show and they're crushing it they're doing good it's a massive amount of deals happening there's no territory <laughs> And then they get over and be like, oh, my God, where am I going to find this deal from? So, you know, it's, it's, it's refreshing to hear, you know, someone being honest with what's happening in their marketplace. And we all had challenges in our business. Um, I mean, it's every, this business that we're in is full of challenges. I haven't really met any, anyone who's, I mean, I guess they're not really doing much if they're not challenged, right? So, yeah. um, you know, that's a good way to start, you know, making that, that thought process of, bringing it, that different asset class into your portfolio. And I think you're, you'll really be impressed with how you can grow your business with those performing assets. And you know with the partials and collateral assignments and other little things that you could do within that niche, it will help you increase your yield. Right. 
balance, you know, to your portfolio. How's the wholesaling going for you over there? Is it just if you don't find something that's in your wheelhouse, you're turning it around and putting it out because you have the lead gen feeding you and you can make some money, maybe the offset some marketing costs during wholesaling? Or is that like a business that you're like focused on and generating a lot of income from? No, we're not focused on it. Wholesaling for us is kind of an aside. Like, you know, we just don't want to, like you said, we just don't want to deal with this house for whatever reason. And so we're going to uh, wholesale it. But for the most part, we're taking down um, the deals that we get and either fixing and flipping or uh, I guess it still would be a fix and flip, but maybe just listing it as is or doing just some minor cosmetics. It just kind of depends on the, on the property. But um, we're not... Um, high volume wholesalers. I, I have, uh, I, I love the wholesaling business model in concept. I just don't really care for the way it's carried out in execution, uh, by a lot of the people in this, in the wholesaling space. And so that's one of the reasons I avoid it, uh, just cause I want to differentiate myself from what is being so commonly done, at least here in my market in Phoenix. Uh, I feel like, Many people who have gotten into the wholesaling business don't belong there. They don't represent real estate investors well, and they carry on practices that I think are frankly deceptive um, and towards the, the the seller. So there's, but there's no question that wholesaling can be done well. I'm not trying to say this applies to all wholesalers by any means. Um, I just feel like it's important to be transparent with your client and. So if we wholesale, we do so transparently to our client when we feel like it's in theirs and our best interest to try to bring in a different buyer. But like most of the time, 90, 95% of the time, we're taking down the deal and doing whatever it is we feel is the, uh, the right way to go with that property. One of the things that's kind of interesting that we're going to be exploring more, we've done a few in 2019, but we're going to be exploring more in 2020 is also trying to blend in kind of the note business with our fix and flip business. And what I mean by that is we've secured a, um, a source of lending that will allow us to lend or will, we'll, I'm sorry, they will lend to us and will allow us to flip on a contract, meaning we can turn that ass, we can sell that asset to that house to somebody who wants, who needs seller financing, mm. it allows to wrap that underlying loan and uh, so that's the business I'm really excited about. I feel like there's two segments in the marketplace that are not being addressed by the traditional real estate model or by wholesalers. That, and those are people that I really want to do a better job helping in 2020. So the, the first group I just alluded to, actually it's the second group, but that, that second group then is buyers who don't um, have the ability or the desire to get traditional financing right now. It might be a business owner who needs to protect their credit uh, to use uh, for a business loan that they're they're obtaining. Uh, it could be somebody who, as we all know, there's all sorts of situations that lead to credit challenges um, and uh, or, you know, commission-based salespeople, et cetera. There's a lot of great people out there who earn good income, who save up some money, but can't or don't want to get conventional financing. We'd like to be able to finance them a home. Um, so that's one group. And the other group is people who own a home but they are stuck. They owe more than they can um, than they can net by selling it traditionally, and so that's another group of people that we really want to do a better job uh, finding and helping in 2020. We are we've done a number of those over the years, um, but uh, you know, it, it commonly known as subject to, right? So, purchasing homes subject to the existing <laughs> financing, giving that homeowner an out, and um, and then we can turn around and sell or finance that property um, to one of the other groups that I was referring to that need financing provided for them. So, I th so that's part of our business that we're really looking to grow in 2020. And I think we can grow it even more so with this other lending source that I refer to because now we can sell or finance properties even if we don't buy them sub two. Yeah, that's awesome. And I like the hybrid strategy where are helping people who can't, get rid of those properties. A lot of forced sub by owners, a lot of people who may have um, uh, did one of those modifications where the interest is above what they right. value is and you kind of do the subject to strategy and help them out and create that wrap, creating another passive income stream for yourself also. 
Correct. That rapping is just a whole creative strategy. I love it, man. It's it's good to see that people are not just doing the vanilla type of, of deals. That it's creative. There's some thought that goes into it. We're all parties involved and benefiting from it. Um, and it's laptop, cell phone. You know, it's it's basically doing it from your desk, and you're not. You still have to do some type of the diligence on the property, but once you um, sell off that flip or whatever and create those financing terms, you step into the shoes of the lender and that person becomes a property owner slash property manager. And then you have that passive, passive role play as a lender. That's this is great stuff, man. I definitely appreciate you coming on. Yeah, you bet. I know you don't have anything to sell, but are you in your local community or maybe you have a podcast or something where you where you're educating others? Um, not in a format where you have training classes or anything else, but what are you doing for the new guys out there? They want to learn or they want to do what you do or inspire to, to do something that you're doing. Well, you know, I appreciate you asking that, but you're right. I don't have a format that I, um, I love to teach and I love to help. Um, and, uh, but I don't um, have an active format outside of my company. I do training days here in my office where We'll just pick a topic and we'll dive into it so that my, even if it's not relevant to everybody on my team, I just want them to understand more, you know, better what we do and what's possible and, and just for their own financial, uh, you know, IQ to expand. And so we do it internally in our office. And so I will say we are looking to grow our team. If somebody's interested in, in their, they live in, uh, in Phoenix, they could go to our website and say, Hey, I'm interested. Anyway, so that would be something that uh, somebody wanted to uh, explore. We, we could have that conversation. Um, more from a financial perspective, of course, too, we are always looking for um, passive investors that are looking for that safe, stable rate of return um, as it relates to the note business as we were discussing earlier. So if somebody's looking, they have some capital that they would like to deploy um, we could uh, talk about that too, but uh, I don't have I don't have a product to sell. I don't have a <laughs> course. I think about it occasionally because I, yeah. But I think what you're doing is awesome. I just there's no there's so many great educators out there doing podcasts and shows, and I just haven't jumped into the into that space yet. This is all good. The trusted home buyer. Make sure you guys check out the website, thetrustthehomebuyer.com. Also check them out on Facebook, the Trust the Home Buyer. And Instagram, finally, I got somebody who's on Instagram. <laughs> like, everybody, I interview like Instagram. What's that? No, I'm just kidding. But first guy on Instagram, also the trusted home buyer on Instagram. Make sure you check them out. I mean, this was a great interview. I definitely appreciate you taking the time this morning to to come on and allow me to kind of uh, eject some of that, uh, extract actually some of that uh, knowledge from you and share with the people in the show. Another great episode, guys. PFREI, Passion for Real Estate Investing. Check us out on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and all the other social media channels. Thanks, so much. Thanks a lot, Martin. I definitely appreciate it, man. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.